Greetings! Oh, what is up and a very warm welcome to the channel The Sun is Shining and the Magpie is casting. Come at you guys this lockdown blurs day the 4th of May with a live 1 vs 1 game fresh from the top of the Company of Heroes 2 ladder featuring a spawning in the south. It's going to be the Overcommand West pieces of Caesar. And spawning in the... wait, this is the south. Did I say south? Because this guy's spawning in the south. Spawning in the north playing as the UKF forces. It's going to be... Inca Una. So, uh, yep, yeah. um, Inca Una, I definitely remember. We've cast some games from this guy. He's pretty talented. Definitely, definitely towards the top end of uh, the meta, the upper echelons of power in this game. Um, Caesar doesn't ring a bell, but it wouldn't surprise me if I have cast him at some point over the years. Um, it wouldn't even surprise me if I cast him recently. Um, sometimes my memory does not function as I would hope. Um, but uh, yeah, I saw this game. It was uh, top top of the ladder, um, decent map, and it's going to be OKW versus UKF, two factions that I am uh, still very much keen to see after the uh, after the patch. What was it? The week before last now. Um, so uh, yeah, let's. Uh, uh, well, I was, yeah, go on then. Let's have a look at the commanders that Inca Una has here. So we've got um, Lendlease Assault Regiment. So this is the guy who I am least familiar with out of the UKF roster. Um, does give you those assault infantry sections. Um, so all of the call-in sort of special infantry sections for UKF have kind of been indirectly buffed insofar as they all just apparently now just come with five men. They just operate independently of the five-man upgrade. So that's kind of a buff for them. Um, and uh, wow, these storm pioneers getting cut down. Lee Enfield's pretty mean, and that's a that's a lot of value in Karuna being able to get there for two Tommies so far. Um, let's see now. We've got Vanguard Operations Regiment. Now this guy always used to be basically my favourite UKF commander. You get a good balance of stuff in there. You get the crocodile for some late game lols. You get the commander glider for the for the command. Whoa, we lost the storm pioneers. Whoa, that's crazy. Okay, wow, okay. Losing your Storm Pioneers at the sub three minute mark is, that is tough. That is like the worst thing that can happen to an OKW player, pretty much. Um, so that is, he's now gonna, he's basically starting this game with what, a 280 manpower deficit? Is that how much they cost these days? 300 manpower deficit, yep. So just you, I mean, cause there we go. You 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 must rebuy your Storm Pioneers. It is not really, you could, you could play maybe the first five or six or seven minutes of the game without Storm Pioneers, but it, it is not, it is not an acceptable proposition to try and play through a game of Company of Heroes 2 without your Storm Pioneers. They're so integral to everything that OKW want to be doing. Um, yeah, you, you just you just will always need an engineer infantry squad, basically, when you're playing this game. And uh, yeah, that's uh, quite the setback to be losing such an expensive one. But there we go. Um, and so who's this guy on the end here? We've got the Mobile Assault Regiment and good old Land Mattress Geezer. Nice. Um, been a been a hot minute since I've seen a land mattress in uh, in ladder play, and uh, would like to would like to see one. See what they're up to. Looks like Caesar here going to be running with the fortifications doctrine, the breakthrough. Well, no, that's ground offensive doctrine, and the Luftwaffe ground forces doctrine. Uh, did I get this right? Yeah, that is fortifications, Geezer. Nice. And as these two players rove around the map and get their initial scuffles underway, let's have a little think here. Uh, so it's been what a few days now since I cast a video. Lockdown doth continue. Uh, it's just kind of more boring lockdown times, to be honest. It's um, making my work a little more challenging, a little bit more difficult. So I, I do relish a challenge. Um, there have been some sort of upsides to this whole lockdown thing, but generally, I mean, I think pretty much I speak for most people in the world now when I say we're kind of ready for this lockdown to be over. Um, but you know knowing what i do about virology and knowing what i do about the way the world is and things like that i suppose i i am glad that lockdown is on and i appreciate that it is the correct thing to do for it still to be on especially in this country i can't speak for others um so yeah we just got to kind of wait it out and just deal with it as best we can um uh let's see so there was a there was a smash uh the online major the quarantine major that was um, over the weekend so those of you who are into smash ultimate you can check that one out um you can you can hit the long stream on twitch or you can find the vods on youtube that was a fun one um i've not actually done watching it so i don't really know but i just it was full of upsets so a really interesting tournament there um so yeah that's been fun what else has been going on um gsl code s has been entertaining um spoilers i'm going to talk about that for a little bit i suppose so if you have not yet watched the round of 24 in the gsl code s just probably skip forward a minute or two on this video because i'm going to talk about how da -da 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 -da. okay you've had your warning now dude scarlet totally got into the round of what are they up to is it the round of 
I think it's going to be the round of 16 next because 12 players come through from the round of 24 plus four who were seeded from the GSL Super Tournament, I think is how it works. Um, so yeah, she made it into the round of 16. She took out Rogue in like just my, my favorite series of the round of 24. It was so good. That's worth a watch if you haven't seen it. Um, Scarlet vs. Rogue. God damn, she came prepared. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, StarCraft 2 has just been... Uh, what, a, what a game that is to watch. Oh my god, that, that's just been some fantastic stuff. It's nice to have that game back. They had a several month hiatus while uh, they set up some new tournaments and then they were all, you know, that all coincided with just when this whole coronavirus started getting pretty big. So there hasn't been a lot of StarCraft 2 recently, but it is back on now in Korea. And uh, yeah, that's been hilarious to watch. Um, let me think now, what else, has, what else has been going on? Looks like we've got Battle Group Attack here, BT Dubs. Uh, we've got pretty uninteresting stuff here from the UKF player. Mixing in a super early um, quarter pounder AT gun here. I mean, that is that is, that is is insurance against a, an early um, Panzer II Luke. We know that that's not happening. And um, obviously, if Caesar had any intel about the what, what the base looks like over here, um, yeah, then they might not have gone for the quarter pounder. I mean, we may see. Pardon me. Terribly sorry. We may see um, a flak half track come out, um, but for now that quarter pounder is does feel a little early. That is, there is not a lot of utility that this quarter pounder is bringing to the table right now. Look at the top left. Not a lot of units there that the uh, AT gun wants to be shooting at. Um, uh, looks like field control been more or less even, perhaps a slight axis advantage, and uh, there's actually going to be a triple cap getting established here momentarily. Slight ticket lead for our axis player, so it looks like that's going to be setting the texture of the early game here, uh, and that should be expanding as the game as the game moves forward. Some British boots managed to get onto the uh, East VP here, and that's going to help out. Um, yeah, what, what else have we been doing recently? I don't know really. Um, there was a new set came out in Magic the Gathering. Haven't really given it a go to be honest. Uh, I, I will be doing so on Magic the Gathering Arena at some point, but I just haven't really got around to it. We've got some new casting hardware in the post. I'm hoping that that's going to arrive um, soonish. Uh, we've got a new interface, we've got some new headphones, so hopefully that's going to make my life easier. And um, hopefully they're going to be slightly more compatible with the other hardware that I have. That's like fingers crossed because that would be really cool. That way I can get my setup going in the other room and that'll be that'll be really cool. Cool for me. Uh, oh yeah, shout outs to my geezer Slady. Um, Slade Tech matey. Uh, just, um, <laughs> I don't know. He's just always commenting in the channel and uh, always... Always pointing out some useful information and stuff like that. And uh, I did say I'd uh, give him a shout out on the channel. So Slady mate, if you're listening, this one goes out to you, bro. And uh, I hope things start picking up for you out there in America. Uh, looks like an MG34 here in a nice position. Getting a little bit flanked though. Down to one one man, not falling back. So taking riotous amounts of damage, any amount of focus fire. These Lee Enfield rounds are all hyper lethal. <laughs> he gets out of there. A little bit lucky there. Probably wouldn't have been in the, the, the end of the world. He probably would have been able to pick up that uh, MG34. Uh, but it would have been an annoying squad wipe for sure. Storm Pioneer is going to be coming on in here. The Metal Detector is finished on them. Hopefully they're going to fare a little bit better than their predecessors. It's going to be a light gun build here from Caesar. And we are seeing this uh relatively often at least on the channel small sample size i know but it does seem to feel like okw players are sort of uh coalescing around the like as an acceptable kind of early game unit and that's nice to see i've always felt that the like should be the backbone of okw's early game plays but it never has really been in a position to provide that support that, that you really wanted it to until recent times um now of course with its ability to come out a little bit cheaper that's massive and also to put down smoke that's the biggest thing like it blows my mind that they just released okw as a faction with no access to smoke um at all in like the early or mid game outside of a commander there, there was just no way of getting smoke on okw and this is a game where like if you don't have smoke then a machine gun in a building is basically like you can't do anything about that before like the 10 minute mark in the game like it's you know and um you know as we all remember actually when uh, okw first came out of course folks grenadiers didn't even have incendiaries and then they added incendiaries as a way of helping you beat mgs in buildings and it's like but we still can't get to the mg in the building because it's an MG, and like, Volks Grenadiers get pinned, so can we have some smoke? Like, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah, we got smoke now, that's great. I'm still, every time I see a lag with the smoke button here, I'm just like, oh, a little bit of me, a little part of my soul is pretty happy. Um, 
so yeah still loving that still loving that the light gun is also just like affordable now at 270 mine power it's just found the niche that it needed to occupy within the game and that's great that is great actually you know what whilst i'm talking about other stuff that's not company of heroes 2 related actually how we've we got a bit of a fight coming down here so let's just focus on this mg34 going to be daquering away from midfield plenty of tommies and uh volks exchanging all over the map here incendiary grenade gonna force back a vicar's gun from uh, its vantage point along the midline of the map. And it looks like Caesar here set to make uh, some pretty nice gains here. The light gun hitting in for a little bit of damage. That's always nice to see. Actually, half a, half a level of veterancy on that gun already. Testament to its uh, accuracy. Jeez. Is it just me or a light gun's kind of... I, 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 I hesitate to say good, but are they kind of okay now? They seem okay. Oh, great. The times we live in. Uh, and as, uh, as Caesar breaks uh, the substantial backbone of this OK, of this uh, UKF resistance, um, I'll take a moment to mention as well. I believe it's in June. The Command and Conquer Remastered package comes out on Steam and probably other places. Dude, that's hype! Command and Conquer, a series probably quite dear to the hearts of many of my watchers and viewers and listeners, um, and very dear to my heart. I think Command and Conquer was the first RTS that I really latched onto as like, hey. I like this game, I want to be playing it. Um, and yeah, Command & Conquer and Command & Conquer Red Alert um, kind of ushered me into RTS in a in a fairly big way. And you know what the funny thing is? I actually didn't play Red Alert on PC. Red Alert was my most played Command & Conquer and I did not play it on PC. I did not have it on PC. I played it on PS1. Yes, that's right, on PlayStation. So me and my friends, we used to LAN up our PlayStations. We used to play Command & Conquer Red Alert with PlayStation controllers. And I'm going to I'm gonna be real with you guys. We were about as good as you could get, like, using a controller in an RTS. Like, we just accepted that that was how the game was going to be played, and we let loose on it. And in some ways, Red Alert on the PlayStation was actually really good. Um, the graphics were actually a little bit buffed. The engine ran a little bit smoother. Um, it was, like, a version 1.2 of the engine or something like that. So, like, there were some cool animations for Shroud and uh, Fog of Wars uh, and stuff. So... Yeah, it was actually really cool. Um, but I am looking forward to playing that game in its remastered form on PC. Now, because I because that was like my first RTS game, and because I was like, I don't know, I must have been, I cannot have been very old, let's put it that way, when I was playing uh, Red Alert. I, I, it's, it's actually, I can't even, it's hard for me to imagine. Like, what it must have been, what, 1996, I'm going to guess? So Young Magpie would have been like 9 or 10 years, between 8 and 10 years, or something like that. I don't know. I, I feel like I was pretty young when I was playing Red Alert, the first one. Um, and uh, yeah, we played it a ton, but of course when you are that age and you're sort of learning the basics of RTS, you are not playing in a very competitive way. And on PlayStation, we had no online matchmaking or no real way of kind of finding other opponents outside of a little friends group. So... Um, I actually have no idea what high-level Command & Conquer looks like. I actually even don't know if Command & Conquer, the game, is really detailed and nuanced enough to support anything that we... to, to support a high-level play environment. I, I honestly just don't know. I have no idea what the meta looks like. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Um, I have no idea what the meta would look like. I have no idea about anything about, com about um, Command & Conquer and how it might look. Um, in the hands of people who are good at RTS. Absolutely no idea. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I probably will be picking up the remastered package. I believe it's not going to be like full game release price. It's going to be about sort of £20 sterling. Uh, something like that. Or £15 maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, but so yeah, for that I'll probably be picking it up and I'm um, giving it a go. Who knows? I might even head out on the ladder and see what we can get done. Assuming that, you know online play looks like something I want to get involved with. Again, hard to say. These are old games um, and I have no idea if uh, that sort of play is going to be appetizing to me. Um, but that's exciting. Command & Conquer Remastered coming in June. That's hype. I, that's exciting. Going to be doing that for sure. Um, <clears throat> right. I've been blathering on about various stuff for a little while now. Let's turn our attention back to the game that we have unfolding before us. Um, obviously, there's a Cromwell on the field. Uh, that sledge hammered in, caught the OKW player Caesar here, a little bit, uh, a little bit off guard. Mm, was able to utilize this line of sight blocker to break a few OKW squads, push back the MGs. We've got double Kettenwerfer on the field though now, so Caesar definitely has the tools to deal with the British medium tank. Uh, and Langrisky, a small enough map where two Kettenwerfers actually really will cover you, even against the whole 
sort of breadth of the map. Those are uh, British mines there, so no danger to this Cromwell. And uh, yeah, this Cromwell just going to be shoving around units that really can't interact with it. Actually, a Kettenwerfer is here to cover. That's going to force the uh, force the Cromwell back for now. Oof, it takes an extra hit on the way out. This Cromwell a little bit low now. Probably wants to scurry away. Let's check the tech for the OKW player. And we can see Schwerpanzer HQ with Panzer author authorization is up. And we're approaching Panzer IV money. So yeah, we're going to have Panzer IV option very shortly. Or we could save for more. Uh, looks like uh, Inkaruna is going to go ahead and pick the Assault Regiment guy, Mobile Assault Regiment. And that's how comes we've got flamethrowers on these Royal Engineers. They're going to be burninating as many Germans as they can. Um, and so what else are we getting here? We get the burninators, we get advanced cover combat, they get the improved cover bonus for 30 seconds. Um, and they receive the regular cover bonus out of cover. Interesting. All right, so that's 75 munitions. We'll see if we see that used. Uh, we get, uh, this is the vehicle repair um, operation that we can see happening now. Uh, so smoke comes down and that enables the vehicles to repair. We've got two squads of Royal Engineers as well. So these repairs are coming down quickly. No metal detector, worth noting though. Flammenwerfer or flamethrower on both squads. Uh, Panzer IV indeed will be the choice here for the uh, OKW player. That does make sense. The Panzer IV is a great tank and it will help deal with the Cromwell to a large extent whilst also presenting a decent threat against all of these infantry squads. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the Panzer IV here from Caesar. It is a firmly okay choice. Um, looks like Caesar's going to go ahead and choose the Fortification Doctrine. That's how come we saw an S minefield getting set up by those Volks Grenadiers just now. That's going to be blowing up some Tommies here. Nice stuff. And this is one of those maps where a single pack 43 in a nice position will lock down like about two thirds of the relevant map area, the relevant play area. So yeah, this is potentially a very strong commander. This is also a map that's small enough where if you build a left 18 pretty much in a place where it can't be touched in your base, then uh, you know it can rain down fire onto pretty much anywhere that you would want it to. Um, uh, if Caesar realizes that he's up against... Yeah, Caesar will know that he's up against the uh, Mobile Assault Regiment. So I feel like we're unlikely to see a left 18. And to a certain extent, I feel like we're unlikely to see a Pack 43 as well. Because the capability to counter it with flamethrowers and a land mattress. Um, there's just stuff out there. This, this, this commander seems like quite well suited to deal with emplacements. So I feel like feel like we're less likely to see a pack 43 but who knows i mean caesar definitely picked this commander with uh, a plan in mind to do something so anyway panzer 4 here gonna meet the cromwell and uh, the initial exchange favoring the german panzer uh yep the frontal armor on that panzer seemingly proof at this range against what uh, against the cromwell's offerings but now there's gonna be a second cromwell on the field so this represents quite a lot of mobile armor now that the uh that the British player is going to have access to. And uh, quite a lot of sort of squad wiping ability as well. Storm Pioneer is going to be creeping forwards in the east, laying mines as they do so. Volks Grenadiers, oh, they just get denied on the building here, and these Tommies will shred them. Uh, STGs are all good and well, but this is 10 Tommies with cover bonus. Nice grenade coming through here, but uh, the fallback will be forced as the Cromwell comes forward. Massive fight going over on over here in west as well. MG34, whoa, this uh, AT gun actually coming way far forwards. I think that was possibly a bad move command there from Inca, as this AT gun just coming up right into these Volks and into an MG. A little bit awkward there. Kettenwerfer here as well. Looks like this Cromwell manages to sneak in along the side of its arc. Um, wow, really back and forth game here. But the real storyline, as you can see at the top of the screen, is going to be the VP situation about, uh, what is that? It's like a 100 and something or other, 180 ticket lead around about there for uh, our OKW player Caesar here. And that has to be Inkaruna's primary concern here. Like, I love the composition. I think Inkaruna is taking reasonable fights on the map. I haven't seen any sort of egregious mistakes. Uh, but we do need to be mindful of our control of the VPs. Looks like the Panzer IV falls foul of the uh, modified M6 mines that were there. And now, uh, I don't think... Where's the AT gun? Oh, the AT gun is actually getting close to being able to contribute. Here it is, trying to find the Panzer IV in arc. And now this Panzer IV, there are two Cromwells here. Kettenwerfer is also in the hood, but it's kind of getting pushed around by one of the Cromwells. So this Panzer IV in a slightly bad way. We'll see if the uh, quarter pounder... Nope, doesn't get an extra shot there. So I think this Panzer IV will be able to sneak away. <clears throat> but a nice push here from the British player. Actually, hang on a second. Okay, yeah, this Panzer IV is going to be okay. There's a world in which the British player just decides to YOLO with these two Cromwells. And, uh, I mean, I know because I don't have Fog of War... 
that that isn't going to be a smart decision because this Panzer IV basically has no support. So the Cromwell comes in, sees the stricken Panzer IV sneaking away. Quarter pounder AT gun gets set up in a nice position. Going to take a shot here. Bonk. And that's a kill. Nicely done there. Inkaruna trading out the quarter pounder as it turns out, but he's going to be able to retrieve that hardware if he wants to. And that has to be a good feeling for the British player. Picking off a Panzer IV for, I mean for the crew on your quarter pounder. I mean, you'll take those trades any day of the week. Wow, actually, we're gonna get some shots onto these um, storm pioneers who are scavenging. That's risky. Okay, they survive. Remember, they're like hyper vulnerable while scavenging, unless that's been changed and I don't know about it, but it, that always, always used to be the case. They had like massively increased received accuracy, making them very, very um, susceptible to harm whilst doing things like that. Um, so we've picked off the Panzer IV, and we are taking nice fights as a Karuna. Oh, is that a land mattress? Land mattress. Oh, wicked. I have not seen one of these for ages. That's awesome. But uh, Inkaruna needs to be more mindful, I think, of controlling the midline of the map. We've got an NG off. Quick, who can deploy theirs the faster? And it looks like the Vickers gun gets deployed first. That's going to be massive. Oh, just cutting down the MG34 crew. They will be shredded. He'll be lucky to get that out. And there we go. It's going to get gunned down as well. So Caesar here in a pretty bad way, but does have some time. Time is a luxury Caesar has. 426 tickets over 199. So, you know, about a 226 ticket lead there. 227, I suppose. Um, and that's okay, but we need to stem the bleeding. We have enough money for another Panzer IV, but I'm not convinced it's a very good choice. You know what I'm convinced is? Jagdpanzer. You've got two beautiful targets for a Jagdpanzer on the field. Langriskaya is a great map for a Jagdpanzer because it's just pretty easy to micro that thing when the middle of the map is so open. You just keep the gun pointed in the right direction, tell it to only shoot vehicles, and just keep it out of harm's way, and it will bop these Cromwells. So it's going to be a Panzer IV. Why, my friend? Why? You know your opponent has, like... Oh, well, anyway, here comes the land mattress barrage. And that's just going to deny access to the middle of the map for a little bit here. Oh, my God. The land mattress barrage kind of mm, puts me in mind of the Katusha barrage insofar as it is low accuracy, but, like, high duration. It goes on. It's just denying this area. Still denying. There we go. Um, and so it is very useful for helping you control these middle VPs. As soon as your opponent, as soon as you feel like your opponent is making a concerted effort to push for one of the middle or, or any crucial part of the map, really, you can uh, deploy the land mattress barrage and basically just force them to have to, like, put their infantry somewhere else. Because you just, you don't want to be there when it's raining explosives. You just don't want any part of that. So that's going to be really useful. He really needs to grab a VP, though. How are we still under a double cap when we've been slaying this uh, OKW player? Come on, man. We've got to take these VPs seriously, or else this is going to be one of those games where you won the battles but lost the game. So why are these Tommies skipping forward to grab a random control point where they are under arcs and getting hooned on when they could have been trying to get this VP in Fog of War? I mean, it's like... Ah... We got, we got to take care of the VPs, man. Okay, so here comes the Panzer IV. Where's the quarter pounder? Quarter pounder is just now coming up into position in mid. The other Cromwell's way back. Actually, sorry. Where is the other? Yeah, here we are. Way back repairing. Are they actually reloading these rockets one by one? Oh, okay. I thought there was like I thought they were actually putting rockets in. That would have been cool. That would have been a cool animation. So finally, Inkaruna here, able to stop the clock at 163 and uh, needs to devote significant attention and resource to controlling the midline of the map. Cannot really afford any more bleed. We're at 24 minutes in this game and Inkaruna would be killed in under three minutes of triple cap time. So just needs to, just needs to keep the three VPs under UKF control as far as possible. So let's see, have we got any sign of Hammer Tech? Not yet. Hammer Tech does seem to be the hotness right now for UKF player on account of the Comet being pretty spicy. So we'll see if we're going to have Hammer Tech come down here. Hammer Tech. Um. Obersoldaten going to be the choice here for Caesar. That actually makes sense. Um, Caesar does have the luxury of time. Land Mattress Barrage coming in here. Oh my god. These things just still look pretty terrifying to deal with. Oh my god, that Rakettenwerf are sneaking past the rockets somehow. It just, it's just a sustained barrage. The amount of sustain on the Land Mattress Barrage. I believe... 
I don't know, it's been a while since I've looked at Wikipedia or Googled this. But d didn't the land mattress have 40 rockets in it? Is it 40? So it looks like we've got 3 by 2, 3, 4, 5, so that's 15. 30 rockets, okay. Assuming that that's modelled accurately. Uh, there's a lot of rockets for a man-portable, sort of rolling, low-production-cost unit. Um, how much are they to call in in the game now? 40 fuel and 350 manpower. So for a rocket artillery piece, that is still relatively cheap. Um, and, you know, it is fairly low risk. I mean, your opponent has to be quite hard pushed to break through and get to this land mattress. And even then, because it is not a fragile vehicle, it's a fragile weapon team. But that is still more durable than your average, like, Panzerwerfer or Katusha or whatever. So... It is relatively low risk, is the land mattress. An interesting unit. So, okay, Panzer IV getting mixed up into the fight here. Taking a few hits off of the quarter pounder and the Cromwell. That will force it back. Second Cromwell coming in from a slightly unexpected angle. Now this Panzer IV significantly flustered. Looks like the Cromwell wants to pursue. There's one Rakettenwerfer here, which is frantically turning. The shot's not materializing for the Cromwell. And the Panzer IV ah, gets picked off by a sweet shot from the quarter pounder, though. Kind of gets forced back into the arc of that quarter pounder. And that's the second Panzer IV going down. Things kind of going from bad to worse here for Caesar. Um... And I'm just going to, I'm just going to, hopefully with the least amount of told you so possible, just harken back to my previous comment about how I feel like a Jagdpanzer was the smarter choice there. You know, Jagdpanzers have the range, they have the stopping power, if you like, to answer. They are more cost effective against armoured units than a Panzer IV. And when you are building this armoured, when you are building a fuel choice into two medium tanks from your UKF opponent, Surely that's the environment in which the Jagdpanzer was designed to thrive in, right? And on, and on Langriskaya, you know, we've all microed SU-85s and Jagdpanzers and to a certain extent ISU-152s and stuff on this map. It's pretty easy, man. You just keep them back here and as soon as your opponent presents an armoured target, just roll them forwards, take a shot, roll them back. Roll them forwards, take a shot, roll them back. And it's just pretty difficult for your opponent to get to grips with a tank destroyer style unit under those circumstances. And because of the way Langriskaya, the middle of the map, is laid out, like... Uh, a tank destroyer garrisoning anywhere around here locks down like a good two-thirds of the map essentially i mean it, it's not it's not foolproof things can go wrong you have to be awake you have to play the game you have to you know your opponent can flank that position you have to make sure that stuff is all right but it's a relatively easy map to achieve that sort of play style and achieve that kind of value with the uh with the yagtum yagt well with the tank destroyer units put it that way so I feel like I'm still, I feel like the second Panzer IV, perhaps slightly ill-advised. Um, and, you know, maybe a Yagdi would have been better. I don't know. Land mattress here going to be flailing another barrage here over Soldaten. Now we're going to get caught on the fallback coming through the uh, the blast radius, the uh, the lethal zone. Urgh! One of them gets gibbed, but the squad will survive, so that's crucial. Light gun going to reposition. By the way, that light gun on three stars of veterancy, 14 kills, well on its way to a fourth star of veterancy. Testament to how useful these units are being to OKW players these days. I mean, I know that we're half an hour in the game, so you might think three stars of veterancy, not, not super great, but this is still an indirect fire piece. You know, they do vet up a little bit slower on average so I don't know I'm just saying that this thing has provided utility let's put it that way um, so in Karuna here in a, in a nice position going to be shoring up the midline of the map UKF uh, forces going to be grabbing that position but there's a poke here from Caesar going to be moving out into the east of the map double Kettenwerfer leading the way and that's great because it's the two Cromwells who are on defense over here well the initial shell from the Cromwell gives two crewmen on this Kettenwerfer that is nice okay he needs to move the medium tanks and that he will uh, and Caesar right now needs to save manpower to spend his fuel I mean it's easy for me to say but that's uh, that's the task ahead and, you know, these land mattress, the, this land mattress is making that pretty difficult. And just the constant war of attrition to control midline on the map, making that difficult. But we do need to spend that fuel, of course. No sign of um, mechanized regiment HQ, so I don't think we're on a KT plan. And indeed, a KT plan would seem ill-advised in this position. Like, you just don't have the best map control, so you don't have the best fuel income. So is it realistic to be going for a KT right now? Yeah, I would argue that you would kind of need to stabilize, kind of need to convert that fuel into battlefield value in a more immediate way. And um, oh, I'm just a broken record, but let's let's get let's get a Jagdpanzer out here, Caesar. Let's do it. So okay, uh, MG34 oh, gets destroyed as well. So Inkaruna just out for blood here, putting together what is becoming quite a convincing showcase of UKF power. 
uh, up to three Cromwells, of course, I'm sure you've all noticed. And that represents considerable mobility and squad wiping power, because, I mean, this is the thing with Cromwells. You can, they are fast enough to run down retreating infantry units. So two Rakettenwerf is desperately trying to hold the tide here. The Cromwell's even content to stay and trade for a bit of damage on one of them, looking to perhaps pick off a star of veterancy there. Whoa, bro, you need to get this tank out of here. Let's get out of here now. There we go. Um, there we go, that's four stars of veterancy on the light gun. It gives you something super meh. An extra shot per salvo. Cool. I will say this for the, uh, for the, uh, light gun. The, um, the veterans he really kind of, in my opinion, needs looking at is just so underwhelming. Um, but there we go. So land mattress here, just kind of keeping the OKW player back. I mean, that's not the best barrage, but, you know, the land mattress is actually a low enough investment that it is the one rocket artillery I feel more so than any others. You are okay taking speculative, speculative, spe speculative, speculative, speculatory. You are okay taking like barrages basically where you don't really know what you're firing at, but you think there might be something there and you just want to deny the area from your opponent. Because it doesn't represent the squandering of that many resources. They seem to reload like in the same time as your average rocket artillery. It seems to be about 90 seconds, maybe a bit more. And the duration of the barrage is, like, decent enough. You you can actually just fire speculative barrages, and it's kind of okay. You can even call in, like, two land mattresses for kind of more or less the same cost as a Katusha or a Panzerwerfer, at least in terms of fuel, which is usually the limiting variable. So, uh, I am okay. Like, normally I'm quite critical of players when they throw down these barrages, and it's like, you didn't even have line of sight of where you were shooting. You were just hoping to catch something. Like, normally I'm really critical of those, but with the land mattress, it's like, you know what? That's okay. That is almost a feature. Um, so, obviously, we've all seen we've got Panzer on the, uh, sorry, Panther on the queue here, and I do like the Panther. This makes a lot of sense. It is essentially a better Jag Panzer with a turret, with more armor, um, and it has the capability, you know, if a panther gets to two stars, then it becomes actually very difficult to kill. The armored skirts make it pretty tough. Uh, I mean, it's tough already, but they make it very, very durable. And then if you can get it to two stars, then it's a very real chance that you it's just not going to die that game. And it's going to go on to get four stars and help you stabilize in a really meaningful way. And OKW, you know, they have a lot of they have a lot of units where just if they can just survive, you can actually kind of start turning the game just on the basis of like your units are just getting so much more powerful for the veterancy than than what other factions can achieve for veterancy. So the Panther is okay. Taking a bit of a risky line here, just driving it across the front, side armor exposed. If there was a, pa a quarter pounder lurking here, we would have seen a shot on the side armor. Uh, so a little bit of risky movement there, but he wants to transition across here. Knows he's got a broken engine on a Cromwell here, so he comes on in. Wants to put some more damage onto this one. Quarter Pounder is here for support though, so I don't think the Panther can sneak around for the kill. I don't know. It's got good range. Okay, now yeah, you see other Cromwells are just going to rotate in to save the uh, to save their friend. Land Mattress firing away. I'm not quite sure. Okay, going to be hitting over here to defend this VP. These Volks Grenadiers. This is a brave decision trying to stay. I mean, it looks smart if they don't die. It looks dumb if they die. Okay, smart guy. Smart guy. That was the right choice. <laughs> he, he stays and he gets the VP. I mean, as we all know, if you start suffering core infantry squad wipes in the late game, that is a really fast way to lose the game because your manpower income is so low and you need that manpower anyway just for reinforcing your squads and trying to spend your fuel in a timely manner that losing core infantry you often just cannot replace them so that was quite the risk to be taking there with that with that squad of volks but uh, caesar i guess feeling a little bit desperate now that the score line has substantially closed up obviously in karuna has been like largely dominating the last phase of play uh triple Com cromwell and a ridiculously vetted up ukf army which if i would level a criticism at it is weird to me that he has not yet gotten weapon racks uh okay so hammer tech did finish but we've not gotten weapon racks is that for real that's given the amount of resources he's stacking i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and say that that's an oversight because if these three star tommy squads have bren guns i mean I'm just not sure how you realistically are able to make an infantry advance onto the VPs as the Axis player against three Cromwells and th four three-star Tommy squads with Bren guns with appropriate support in terms of indirect rocket fire and machine gun. Like, that's very difficult to achieve any progress against. 
So kind of neglecting to get some value here as Inkaruna. Definitely the price of those weapon racks, not prohibitive. Has the munitions, of course, to buy all of the Bren guns. So I would I would really like to see him go for the weapon racks just to cement his position in this game. Uh, a small point, but, um, you know, at the high levels of play, it's the small things that are the deciding factors. So anyway, this Panther continuing to try and find profit on the battlefield, continuing to be controlled by the Quarter Pounder mainly, and by the fact that it just can't really cobble together a kill. Oh god damn, things just getting so horrendous on this side of the map as it just continues to rain rockets. The Land Mattress is just a disgusting unit to play against. It feels so horrifying. It, I mean, look how crater-strewn the south side of this map is, you know? And to be fair, this land mattress has not been very successful in terms of damage caused. It's only killed 11 models as one star of veterancy, which actually is, is the veterancy that increases the reload, or increases the reload speed, decreases the reload time, however you want to phrase that. Um, and, okay, quarter pounder here gets taken out. The hardware will, will remain, so that will get recruited, but that's a nice pick off there, getting the veterancy off the AT gun. It's going to help the panther survive in this game. Um, well, wow, Tommy's coming through here into a bit of a killing zone. I'm not sure that they want to stay there very long. Um, so we've got Hammer Tech. That means that they have the grenade pouch, right? The Gammon Bomb. Uh, but no pineapples as far as I know. So are we going to get weapon rack research? Please get weapon racks. I just think it's a great idea. Is there a time? Is this a game where you actually want your dudes to have five Lee Enfields? Or is this genuinely a mistake from Inkaruna? I feel like the weapon rack research would just be great. I just... Why are we not... I feel like he might have just forgotten to click that button and get it done. I, I, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe we want Lee Enfields because... I don't know... But check it out. Caesar manages to get a triple cap going, or is about to. That's huge. Inkaruna, down at 140, and for the first time in a long time, going to be feeling the bleed here. Land Mattress, though. Oh, man. La Land Mattresses just make it so hard to actually achieve infantry onto victory points and capture those points. It's just very difficult. Um, and Inkaruna floating enough resources that if we lose a Cromwell... You probably actually want to buy a Firefly if you lose a Cromwell. Or a Comet, actually. Yeah, of course, a Comet. But, I mean, I really wouldn't hate another Land Mattress. Because two Land Mattresses, that means you're firing a Barrage, say, every 45 seconds if you stagger the Barrages correctly. And the Barrages off a Land Mattress last for, I want to say, like, 12 to 15 seconds. It's, like, a really long time. So that means if you're firing a barrage every like 45 or 55 seconds and those barrages are lasting 12 seconds, like it starts your windows of time to approach these victory points in any significant way with OKW infantry start getting very small. Like that starts becoming an almost impossible task. And we still have a Vickers on the roster, which is like additional deterrent for infantry units that try to approach these victory points. Um, so Inkaruna here rapidly closes the door on Caesar. Going to re-establish that triple cap. It's now Caesar who stands to be bled out of this game in about two minutes if things stand as they are. Now, uh, how do we meaningfully retake the map here? I mean, we just don't really have the core infantry to push onto these points against such reckless UKF gunfire, you know? And any time I feel like you actually manage to clear out the resistance and get the infantry or get the tanks away from a VP, then the land mattress is just like, I'm sorry, no, you don't get to capture this for a while. Um, so I'm basically out of ideas for how Caesar is supposed to win this one. Gonna build a Panzer IV, but I don't really feel like that's the Hail Mary we need here. Land Mattress just firing for value at the moment, not even gonna save it for when the OKW forces break through. Just happy to just fire for value. And that is acceptable. That's fine. That is just, that is also an acceptable use of the Land Mattress unit under these circumstances for me. What? The, look at the look at this look at this area of the map, man. It's like a crater-strewn, charred, smoking wasteland. Then look at the north side of the map. It's basically a nice place to be. You know, if you put out a couple of deck chairs, you know, you could chill out here. It's fine. So, <laughs> that sort of like tells you the sort of how this game has felt and where the action has been, and you know. So anyway. 50 tickets remaining, triple cap still established, so I think we're going to see one last push onto the map here from Caesar. We still have a Panther, we still have a uh, Panzer IV, we still have, like, some core infantry, you know? 
Oh my god, he's even using, of course, the, the, the British base artillery. And this is just a, another form of duration-heavy indirect fire, which basically just says you cannot approach this victory point until I'm done firing my explosives at it. Like, you just really can't. So, and th you, this is how you win games in the late game. You just, it's, you don't actually have to beat your opponent or defend the victory points if you make it so hazardous for them to get onto those victory points that they just can't do it. So, a l total last ditch attempt here. Volk's Grenadier squad gets wiped. The Panther and the Panzer are going to throw themselves forth. 14 tickets remaining. The triple cap still on. OKW forces do get onto mid, but UKF forces looking substantially unbowed here. Vickers gun in a beautiful position, suppressing three infantry squads. The Panzers, you know, doing okay, but they are, they're not enough by themselves to turn the tide and now the rocket artillery is going to fire in and now this i mean well done you got you got some infantry onto this bp but the rocket artillery can just say no and there's no time left on the clock here for caesar and in karuna doing i mean i was a little bit concerned with how many victory point ticket or, or how much scoreline advantage he gave up in the early and the early mid game but clearly once in Karuna stabilized you know we saw cromwell's used in a way which we're kind of used to seeing t-34s used just kind of the first one gets out, the first one finds value and is profitable, and then it is followed rapidly by additional medium tanks. And then that value starts snowballing. You know, if the first medium tank comes out and it's let, met by hard resistance, and it's either, like, just beaten back and spends the whole game repairing and just getting shot by AT guns, or it gets destroyed quite quickly, well, then it's very difficult for you to snowball value out of the medium tanks, of course. But if that first one comes out and starts, you know, really, really... Hans Chicken? Hmm and starts really, really finding value, well... Uh, so, actually, there's a rematch on Langriskaya between these two players. I'm not sure I can just cast another game on that map between those two players. Uh, so we're going to go over to Nexus, I believe. We're going to cast Hands Chicken and some Kanji here. What's this? Akua, something she... I don't actually recognize any of these kanji. Kanji are a dick to learn, and I've not been sticking to my homework recently. Um, let's just see. I'll just have a quick scan. Opportunity cast, blah, blah, blah. We've got Kuro here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. All right, yeah, we're going we're gonna to jump into this Nexus game and cast that one. Uh, but yeah, as, as I was saying, Inkaruna, after stabilizing, just, just looks so dominant there. I'm curious to hear your feedback because that seems like such an elementary mistake to not get the weapon racks when you were drowning in resources and your infantry could have been more kick-ass like and Bren guns were like buffed weren't they recently like they are much better at firing on the move they're not nearly well they're not as sort of um stationary firing dependent as they used to be so I feel like Bren guns are just are, are they are they always better than Lee Enfields I feel like they almost always are I don't know, I'm struggling to think of a time when they're not better than Lee Anfield. Looks like we've got about a two minute delay here before this match begins. Um, I'm not going to cut the videos apart because I still don't have any video editing software worth a damn where that doesn't impact the video quality in a way that I'm not happy with. So I'm just going to sit here with you guys for like 90 seconds. We're just going to chill and it's going to be cool. And if you really want, and you know, I kind of almost recommend this, then you can skip forward 82 seconds from now and uh, get straight into the next game. Or... Or you can choose to be exposed to me filling dead air for another 71 seconds. And that's your decision, you know? And more power to you, you know? We live in a world, it's 2020, where I think it's right that YouTube viewers have the power to make these decisions. I think it's, um, uh, I, I think it's, not, it's not just right, it's imperative for the YouTube economy to reflect the values of viewers and what am i even talking about <laughs> yay filling dead air it's great it's great i need a co-caster maybe i should just invent a co-caster personality i don't know um i yeah but i mean that really does come across as kind of like the bad kind of insanity when you're just like hey co-caster magpie well hey there what's going on ah not much good to be with you oh that's great you know it's like we we I could sit here and do that, but I think it I think it would be unsettling at best. Um, so let's have a little pan around Nexus here. We've got ten seconds to go till the game starts. Uh, Nexus, one of the maps that I was really interested in and thought was a quite innovative and refreshing addition to the map pool, but one which I think has been somewhat maligned by players. Um, I think a lot of people just un have no interest on in playing on this map and. 
uh, to be honest, to a certain extent, I think that larger feeling maps, and this is not even a particularly large map, but it is bigger insofar as like if you have an anti-tank gun up here, it is not going to help you in a fight that's even here, let alone in mid or south of map. And like Langraskaya as a really good contrast, or Crossroads as another good contrast, is just not a map like that. Like if you have an AT gun it pretty much covers two-thirds of the relevant play area of the map on those smaller maps like Crossroads and Langraskaya, and I think generally the players seem to prefer that. And it's fine, it makes for intense games which are constant push and pull, and in a way the action feels a lot more joined up. But it, you don't get the positional uh, decision-making and the sort of force allocation decision-making that you do on maps that have proper sort of different zones for combat where fights are actually like in different places and the other nice thing about maps like this uh is that you know if you have a tiger tank for example then it just can't be in every fight at once on a map like this so i feel like the proper weaknesses of slower heavier units really are manifest on properly balanced maps like this i'm going to call this like a balanced style of map rather than a sort of small or compressed style of map like crossroads or langras um so and i honestly i quite like that because it it, it means that king tigers and tigers and pershings to a certain extent and is2s and isu 152s they don't feel as inevitable as they do on the smaller maps because you can just decline to fight them you'll just be like okay i see your tiger tank is in mid i'm gonna push in north and south or oh you know i i see that your is2 is at north i'm just gonna not be there for now and that is2 and that tiger tank in those circumstances is still getting value it's getting massive value it, you know it's like it's it's actually so powerful that your opponent is not going to be fighting there but at least there's a backdoor option there is another choice there is a decision available to your opponent to say i'm going to prioritize pushing in other areas of the map because right now i don't want to be fighting into a your heavy fuel choice unit whatever that might be and i feel like on maps like crossroads and langra sky it's like they're not actually big enough like you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to fight on the other part of the map from this Tiger Tank. It's like, no, the Tiger Tank will be there in less than 10 seconds shooting you in the face still. And it's like, uh, it just makes them feel very inevitable. And, and that's fine. It does make for cool games, action-packed games. Cool games that are awesome to watch. But like, it's nice that we have maps like this in the pool where there's a change of pace. Anyway, speaking of change of pace, we've got some interesting stuff already coming out from both of these two players. We've got a special rifle company opening here for uh, Hans Chicken. Um, so we've got the clown car out. We've got This is going to be a penal build as well, so I'm already excited to see what Hans is going to be bringing. The commander pick here is going to be the forward HQ geezer, whose name I always forget. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Urban defense tactics. You know, so this is the guy who gets the light AT gun, gets the shock troops, gets the booby trap points, and of course gets the siege tank, uh, the KV-2 heavy assault tank in the late game. Uh, so a nice commander with something to offer in all phases of the game and some transformational aspects. Basically everything I look for in a commander that Magpie can officially brand as spicy. Um, so yeah, excited to see what Hans Chicken's going to be putting together. Spicy commander plus spicy penal special rifle com company opening. I am liking what I'm seeing here. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, Kanji here looks like we're already yep we got a we got an atypical unusual non-meta commander pick here we've got Overwatch Doctrine and of course that also makes me happy because Goliaths and Goliaths are great <laughs> um, I, I have a lot of fun with Goliaths um, I've already actually pointed people towards these videos on my channel recently but if you if you like Goliaths or if you are curious about the kinds of mayhem that I inflict out on the ladder or used to inflict in times gone by do search my YouTube channel for the Goliath compilation video. It's just a couple of Goliath, sweet, sweet Goliath games that I played and I cut some of the better hits together into a compilation. Noise. Uh, and if you enjoy watching me blow people up with Goliaths, you'll enjoy watching me blow people up with Storm Tigers. Uh, and uh, you can search my video, my YouTube channel for the Storm Tiger compilation, uh, which um, literally is just that. Um, video images of dudes getting horrendously abused by me and my storm tiger so yeah um if that's your thing if that's if you're the kind of person who's into that then you may enjoy those videos so looks like we've got a kubel opening here as well actually from the okw player which is becoming less a spot a rakettenwerfer comes through with a lovely hit onto that scout car that one gets taken out real early here as often scout cars are wont to do i mean i think everybody when you when you go for a clown car opening it is it is you accept the asterisk disclaimer that your clown car may die very rapidly and that's fine you know they're cheap you don't expect them to have much longevity in your average game demo charge comes down here actually controversial there's a lot of munitions to be laying down for a pretty speculative 
mm, demo charge there. Uh, I think you were kind of relying on Kanji to be asleep if you really thought that that was going to do any damage. Jaeger Light Infantry Command Squad. Actually, Infantry Jaeger Light Infantry Recon Squad. Yeah, just Jaeger Light Infantry. They've got like they've changed the um the icon for this a little bit. So for a second, I thought it was something different. So yeah, Jaeger Light Infantry Squad going to be coming out onto the field here. How much are they now? 300? 280. Okay. Um, and that's a very useful squad. It has sprint, it can scavenge, it has uh, booby trap point, and you can upgrade them with the G43, and it be basically becomes the closest analogue that OKW has to an actual sniper. I'm still hoping one day they'll add a commander to the game, although we may now be past when the times when they'll ever add commanders to this game. That is, that is a real proposition. But... I have always been excited for the day when they would add a commander to OKW which has access to a German marksman in some guise so that you can call in a German marksman who has access to five stars of veterancy and possibly some other OKW spice. Um, but until that day, Jaeger Light Infantry will be the closest thing OKW can really get to a sniper unit. And uh, there we go, the G43 upgrade coming down. And, um, you know, sniper type units and abilities, um, like high damage per bullet st style stuff, is better the more valuable your opponent's infantry is like per model so penal battalions sort of playing into that i mean penal battalions are worth more than conscripts per head so i don't know that's something i suppose going kanji's way just based on composition it's going to be a battle group opening here for kanji and it's going to be a uh, flat half track opening so that's kind of cool we've got jaeger infantry with kettenwerfer into flat half track so uh definitely not your average okw composition for sure and that's exciting stuff map control here has substantially been favoring the soviet player um just being able to control the midline and have more units marauding into the eastern side of the map than there have been vice versa so um that's going to be resulting in a nice little score lead for the sub 10 minute mark hopefully uh for hands they'll be able to develop that a little bit further and that will be a source of pressure which they can apply through the later stages of the game here comes the flak half track and we'll see if that's going to change the dynamic and be able to retake control over some areas of the map here it's going to start dackering down these penals i think uh, hans thought that they were out of range from those sandbags but they were not and they'll be forced back kubelwagen here going to be getting caught out the ptrs upgrade actually you know what actually is it not a weird choice to go for a flak half track into an opponent who has clearly demonstrated that they are wanting to do a penal build right because don't ptrs's just really make the flak half track have a hard life Am I, am I wrong about this? How much is the PTRS upgrade? Okay, it is reasonably priced, so we're not going to see PTRSs for some time. Weighing in at 60 per upgrade. So I believe that's 30 per rifle, because you get two. Yeah. So 30 munitions per PTRS that you want to add in, but you have to buy them in twos. So I still think that that's probably fine. The fact that the flak half-track is like susceptible to PTRSs, combined with the fact that it has a setup time, so those PTRSs are always going to get to fire first, basically means that PTRSs are actually like better at countering flak half tracks than they even are against other forms of like light axis armor and uh even to bolster that we're having a t70 going to be coming onto the roster um so i feel like this flak half track has come into a tough existence here whoa these pt wow, this could be a squad wipe if things no okay right that was that was getting close but he's going to be just fine Sometimes the damage on the um, flak half track can just roll a load of great hits and just do a ton of damage, and that, that was a bit of a late fallback there. For, so for a second, I was worried for those guys, but he's going to be okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here comes the T70. That is a pretty tidy paint scheme we've got on that one. So I guess one drawback of going for, for penals is that they are a bit more expensive, of course, than your average Soviet infantry. Let me just check how much they do say. So, yeah, 300. Um, so we've gone for three penals. We also went for the, the, for the scout car. Um, and we've gone for the T-70. All of this combined basically means that mm, Hans Chicken actually doesn't have access to the volume of Soviet infantry that we're often used to seeing. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's about a squad behind, maybe two, in terms of what we might expect from a Soviet player. Uh, is this going to be... Yeah, so of course Tank will be Battalion Commanders here because we've got T-70. We'll see if he opts to back tech. I find it unlikely because we have access to the light AT gun. In fact, speaking of which, one's just been called in. So the utility offered by the... Uh, support weapon campanile i mean you basically would just be buying it for maxims at this point 
And he may go for that at some point, to be honest. I mean, this is one of those maps where having a Maxim overwatching VPs is how we often see, like, late games won. You know, well, I say Maxim, just having a machine gun that's overwatching VPs is pretty valuable stuff. Nice mines here, gonna catch out these Volks. Um, so, but who knows, he may actually be able to pick up uh, some Axis hardware as this game goes on to have access to MGs, we'll see. Definitely no pressure to build a special uh, uh, support weapon Campanile at this stage in the game, though. I'm just sort of thinking out loud as I assess the choices available to our Soviet player here. <clears throat> oh, there's some more mines here. Oh, sorry, those are Axis mines, my bad. How many abilities do Storm Pioneers have? It's like a lot. That unit does a lot. T70 getting the better of the uh, Jaeger Lights here. Even going for a bit of a pursuit just to get some damage on. That is a little bit annoying. Oh, he's going to have medics, right? Yeah, he has medics. So these guys are going to get healed. That's fine. Ready for action. So the light AT gun going to find the flak half track here. Yeah, this flak half track having, I mean, three kills. It's been alive for a little while now. You would have hoped it would be on one star of veterancy for the access to the cheap smoke by now, usually. So, I, I mean, it's definitely having a hard life as this flat half track. T70, light AT gun, and just um, even with no PTRSs, uh, having a pretty tough existence finding value out on the field right now as that flat half track. But not dead, so it could go on to achieve things, but we'll see. Not the start in life that you'd want for the OKW player for that flat half track. Kubelwagen comes up to the north to scout and investigate exactly what Soviet units are making making gains up here. Flak half track is going to reposition to support and between the two of them they ought to be able to clear out this uh, this resistance here. This is actually quite a smart place to park it. This is a relatively difficult place to shoot with AT guns. T70 going to commit in here. Has to. There are shoe mines here. There's more shoe mines there as well. So no metal detector for either player as well. So these mines definitely live to get some good hits as the game goes on. Uh, that's shock troops coming onto the field. So we're going to be diversifying his infantry roster here as Hands Chicken. I don't actually like shock troops as much on this map as I do on others, just because it's so open and I feel like basically once the game is 15 minutes old, you're never going to be able to run them into an enemy squad and get those PPSHs firing for max value, just because there's always going to be something wrong. Like they're going to get checked by a vehicle or a machine gun or like something like that. Having said that, there are enough line of sight blockers and enough places for them to lurk. Shoe mines! Ugh. Um... There are enough line of sight blockers and buildings and places for them to lurk, and if they ever do get the drop on, uh, you know, on an enemy squad, they are likely to kill them at close range. So we'll just keep an eye on the shock troops and see how, see how they fare on this map. But I feel like this is a tough map for shock troops to do well. We'll see, though. So smoke comes down to try and buy them some time to cap here, but, you know, between the Kubelwagen and the uh, flak half track ain't going to be enough, and uh, they're not going to be able to get this point. Storm Pioneers come forward to capture, uh, to sorry, to repair the Kuba while it captures the point. Schwerpanzer HQ is getting deployed just north of the OKW base here. We'll see Schwerpanzer, oh sorry, Schwerpanzer HQ has just finished indeed. So how much fuel are we on? Going to be a minute or two before we get to see a fuel spending choice here at the OKW player. In the meantime, putting that Schwerpanzer HQ to use, grabbing the Obersoldaten. Indeed, actually getting second Raketenwerfer is really nice. I know there's only the one T70 out here, but just one Raketenwerfer is actually just not enough to give you the AT coverage that you need on this map. And that T70 has been, like, harassing around the flanks and finding value. Coming up to two stars of veterancy in a little bit here. Massive Soviet push here in mid. We've got, like, loads of Soviet bodies just, m like, running around grabbing points. MG34 is here, but it's a little bit overwhelmed insofar as target saturation goes. You cannot suppress all these squads because there's a nice spread. So that, that that MG is in need of help or a fallback, and a fallback it will be. Flak half-track going to be backing into position to try and contain this advance, and that it will probably be able to do. Where's the light AT gun? Is it in support? It is actually here, yeah, so the light AT gun will be able to dislodge this half-track momentarily if it can get in range. But now the OKW infantry is here to support. Okay, there come the hits. Obersold out and pushing forwards into a flamethrower and a T-70. Looks pretty grim for them. Smoke, no, that's a Bundaroo grenade. Comes down, forces the Earth Soviet engineers back. The flak half-track gets taken away. Oh, it has to push back. Oh, potential squad wipe coming down with these very wounded Volks. Oh, the focus fire is good and hands chicken scoring uh, like a... 
a very uh, a telling blow there against the infantry roster of uh, Kanji. Kanji multitasking being really pushed there. We had OKW using abilities, we had a flak half track that needed micro, and we had loads of infantry squads in the fight, and it seems those Volks Grenadiers just kind of fell through the cracks there. Mm, the fallback just too late to save them. In fact, it, it didn't even come through. Uh, there was a lot of shouting because this Kuba wagon, I believe, hit some mines. Um, oh god, shock troops getting cut down! That is too many flak cannons for these Soviets. And uh, yeah, the um, Schwer Panzer HQ, even from here, can actually cover this point, so that's kind of useful. Kubelwagen will get taken out here. And with that last phase of play, you have to feel Hans Chicken beginning to tighten the noose here. The scoreline, still a, a sort of slight advantage for Hans, uh, but able to secure the kill on a couple of squads there, the Kubelwagen, the Volks Grenadiers. You know, this army in the top left is still fine for Kanji, but it's a bit fragile. Um, the only squad that you're really happy taking fire with in this whole lineup is really the, the, um, the Volks Grenadiers, and we're down to one squad of those. Everything else, it feels really bad if they're getting shot in this army. Uh, so, yeah, not a lot of core infantry to speak of, and this is quite a fragile composition. Uh, a lot of powerful units here, which immediately wilt under any kind of meaningful fire, like the Flak Half-Track, like the Jaeger Lights, like the Obersoldan, like the MG. These are all units that can do great as long as they're not taking any real amount of damage uh, but as soon as they are you have to be hovering over that fallback because they're just too valuable to let die and they're too fragile too um, so we've got tm35 these are soviet mines here and here we've got the uh, axis shoe mines here so both players and more tm35s here so both players spending their mun munitions and it seems like a lot of fighting focused on mid and north at the moment but very little on south so i'm happy to see it looks like these jaeger lights might be looping around to sneak out down to the south try and apply some pressure i feel, I feel like it's been a, a long time since axis units had any pressure on the southern fuel or vp and i would love to see a unit heading out there to flank looks like the t70 Getting a bit lucky there, going to be sneaking away alive after taking fire from two Raketenwerthers. Uh, so that's a fuel spending choice, that's a Panzer IV um, from Kanji. OKW players really loving the Panzer IVs at the moment. Hard to argue with it, I mean, it's always been a good unit and it had, was buffed in the most recent patch. Um, so this is a fine choice. It will do just fine. Plus actually, Panzer IVs always do a little bit better when you know that your opponent skipped support weapon Campania to go for and is relying on the light AT guns. Sure, the M42 can deal with Panzer IVs, but it has a tougher time, especially with the OKW Panzer IV Ausf J, which comes with a slightly harmer, higher armor. It's just a, it's just a tougher target to kill, especially when you're using essentially an undergunned AT unit to try and deal with it. Uh, mechanized armor camp and I are here going to finish up for the Soviet player so we're going to be able to see some fuel spending here from uh, hands as once we have the manpower to take whatever choice they want there's a lot of fuel we've got stacked up here as well actually so will we see hands hold on for a minute here and try and get the kv2 once we have 12 command points or are we going to see a more immediate fuel spending choice to be honest if he saves up for a second here and just catches catches wind of this panzer 4 i mean again I'm like a bloody broken record when it comes to tank destroyers. Ugh. Hang on though, we've got a big, a bit of a fight coming on here. Um, Kettenworth has forced the T-70 back, and this is a lot of angry Germans here. The engineers get hung out to dry here, so finally Hans Chicken uh, losing... Is it, is it just the engineers he lost off that roster? I don't know, that roster seems substantially smaller. Panzer IV going to hit some mines here, and I believe was scouted there, so... Knowing that it's a Panzer IV as the fuel spending of choice from Hans Chicken, how will Kanji adapt? Is it going to be an SU-85? Or, you know, or, I don't know. I feel like I'm just, like I say, a broken record when it comes to, like, why don't players go for more tank destroyers? Wow. Um, but this is just also a map where a tank destroyer is quite easy to micro. In the middle of the map, in fact, just the whole map really is reasonably open. Uh, an SU-85, if it achieves any veterancy, can be very difficult to kill and answers basically any Axis armoured unit that you could name. And that's a lot of power for the price. I just... I feel like the game plays really differently, especially with Soviets, but as any faction, once you have a tank destroyer. Like, because then your opponent is always fighting into a tank destroyer. And a tank destroyer will always fire first on their tanks, all things being well. And just it just makes life so hard it just makes life so hard 
Um, so I don't know. I don't know if we're going to see an SU-85. He is saving, so I feel like this is a KV-2, which is the flashier play. It is literally the more explosive choice, and it is more fun to watch. So... Yeah, I hope. I hope here. I hope it is going to be a KV-2, and I hope it's going to be cool. How much manpower do you need? 630. Actually, so we're still more than a minute of manpower saving away from that. And you can bet Hans Chicken's going to need to reinforce some squads in the meantime. So actually, saving up for that KV-2 is going to be more difficult than we thought. And dare we say it here, but Kanji is starting to feel a bit more confident on the map. Uh... The Panzer IV is helping. Obersoldat and have the MG34 and the Star of Veterancy. They are beginning to flourish in this game. Another squad of Obersoldat are coming out. And I worry. We lost the Volks. Oh no, we lost the other Volks squad at some point over the last phase of play. Sorry, I missed that. But um, I feel like this is a very expensive and very fragile army. With no Volks Grenadiers to be sort of taking the frontline fire and pushing onto the points and screening the fire so that the Obersoldat can do their job without taking so much fire. I mean, this this is still an acceptable composition. It, it can be done, but I I worry that it's just you've got so much power and value tied up in these sort of high value intensity Obersoldaten with no sort of low value intensity units to take the damage for them and let them actually operate. And you know, as we've just seen with Obersoldaten, once they lose two models, if you ain't falling them back, that's a very brave decision. So it doesn't take a lot of damage basically to remove a lot of value from this okw roster you know you just kill four oversold out and suddenly they basically have no anti-infantry dps like i'm exaggerating to a certain extent but it's like it's pretty bad so a little bit worried here for kanji's composition it's fine at the moment and he doesn't seem to have been punished for it too badly yet so i could be wrong that's a kv2 yeah okay that's cool it's not often we get to see a KV-2 on the channel. And, you know, as a StarCraft Terran player, I love a good siege tank. So, I mean, the obvious place to commit the KV-2 is into mid. That is where the lion's share of the fighting has been taking place. And that is where its power and range can probably be best exploited. Hello, Obersoldat. And how did that do no damage? That for sure looked like one of the OKW uh, Obersoldat and models was like within the blast radius. Whoa, the KV-2 coming way too far out. What are we doing here? Oh my god. This is a... What are we doing? This is not how you KV-2. It just comes straight to the very front and then starts rotating, which is its slowest, most awkward action and way of being used. The Stuka support gets used here from the Overwatch Doctrine. The KV-2 gets spanked a little bit by a Panzer IV and a Kettenwerfer and has to slink away on pixels of health. Now, the air support is still active, but with no line of sight, I believe the KV-2 ought to be safe, but that is not how we KV-2. We usually want to put the KV-2 behind units that it can support. If the KV-2 is too close to the front, then it's turret's very slow rotation rate and the very slow rotation rate of the actual tank itself are very exploitable. Combined with its low rate of fire, that actually means that it, it is not best suited to be actually at the very front of your army against the fog of war. It wants to be just behind that, taking sweet shots. A little bit like an ISU-152. Um, you don't have to use it in siege mode. That is not mandatory. I'm not advocating that necessarily, although obviously siege mode is useful and has a place. Um, but I am just saying, when your KV-2 first comes onto the battlefield, don't just drive it straight into the fog of war and start rubbing it up against all of your opponent's units. I, p possibly that was a bad rally. I don't know. These things happen. Uh, and, you know, at least he survives with K the KV-2 intact. So we're going to get to see some more KV-2. But, I mean, that was a little bit close. That was a little bit... That was, a, that was some sweaty times there for Hans Chicken. Okay, so, looks like these uh, players have both had time enough to reinforce, rearm their armies, and we are slowly moving out onto the field. Looks like the, uh, what is this? Ambush tactics, that's what it's called. Here, 
Well, on these light AT guns, going to be being pretty useful to sneak them into position. Quite clustered positioning here, but not going to be punished. Just really one light gun for indirect fire support and splash damage. Um, but this is some clustered units. You wouldn't be doing this if your opponent had a... Oh, that is also a lot of clustered value. Jeez. That was a warning shot. If that one had hit, that would have been a lot of value onto that KV-2. Oosh. Yeah. This is why we love KV-2s, man. We're just going to start sieging you down. You want to fight? you got to fight into this. Arr, finding value. What is it about Soviet units that just chuck huge shells into their opponent? It just makes me smile so hard. You know what? It's not even Soviet units. I'm not discriminatory, okay? I smile this hard at Storm Tigers all the time. Well, anytime Storm Tiger is out, which is like nearly none of the time. But, you know. Okay, so KV-2 going to come forwards here. Wants to track onto this Panzer IV, apparently. Does cast a shell in. Finding some damage, even. So that's not bad. Um, I'm always a bit... Whoa, he's going to push in with the KV-2. Jesus, mate. You're fearless with this thing. It is not a very mobile unit. I just feel really skeptical about using it in this way. So I think he knows where the Panzer IV is. Oh, I thought he might attack ground around there. Nope, seemingly not. Gonna pull back for a second here. Oh, putting massive damage onto those Jaeger lights. And we are coming up to the first star veterancy for the KV-2, which gives it uh, the Inspire Veteran ability. All right, what does this do? 25 munitions gives you nearby infantry move at maximum speed and fire more quickly. Interesting. I wonder what the definition of nearby is. If it's like a screen radius, so like... You know, if, 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 it, if it would affect all infantry, like, say, on this screen, that could be pretty useful. 25 munitions, relatively cheap, because, of course, the ability is localised around the KV-2. So, this is not an ability I've seen used very much, if ever. So, mm, kind of curious about how it... what the exact kind of... how strong the buff is and uh, and what's good. Speaking of what's good, Panther is a pretty sweet choice on this battlefield, actually. The light AT guns will not really be able to threaten that Panther. And I feel like we're kind of at the stage in the game now where I would not mind a support armor, armor camp and I are coming down. Maxims are looking more and more valuable the longer this game goes on. And you cannot really be relying on these M42 AT guns. Uh, sorry, I mean these M42 AT guns to provide AT against... I mean, even the Panzer IV is kind of too much for them, and the Panther is just like, you can really forget about that. Unless something really bad happens to the Panther, those light AT guns are not going to be killing it. So, alright. KV-2 here. Looks like the Panther trying to draw the KV-2 out into the two Kettenwerfers. That it will. So the Kettenwerfer's going to, wow, get a bounce there. That's a Katusha. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Katusha, yeah, has been on the queue. That, that actually forces these guys to break... Oh my god, he gets the kill on one of the Kettenwerfers. The other one just sneaks away. Storm Pioneer is biting the barrage next. But here comes the Panther entering the fight. The M1 AT, M42 AT guns are here, actually finding pretty good damage onto the Panther. So I'm a bit surprised. I feel like that's quite lucky. I mean, I guess it doesn't have its armored skirts yet. But they're doing, they're dealing with this Panther. At close range, they can do it, it seems. The KV-2 is going to try and sneak back for now, and that's wise. So the AT guns just keep repositioning. And I feel like neither the Panther nor the... Uh, Panzer IV can realistically challenge into this position now with these two AT guns. It's just too risky. He comes in to picks off the Rakettenwerfer and Hans Chicken out here kind of kicking ass and taking names. He's sort of making a bit of a statement here and now he gets the siege tank set up in a really forward location. So that's kind of nice. He's going to back it up a bit and that's why I think like this is probably a healthy location. Engineer's going to move into position to try and repair this. Does he have metal detector? He does have metal detector, so that's great as well because there have been a lot of shoe mines around. In fact, there are still a lot of shoe mines around. Oh no, is he going to spot these oversold on? Ah! Oh, phew. I thought the game would crash then. Uh, so yeah, he does spot the Obersoldat and taking half the health off one of the squads with the first shell. But those Obersoldat doing what they do best, scything down allied infantry, and they force the engineers back, and that is massive, because now the KV-2 cannot repair. So I believe that means the Soviet player on the back of, on the, on, basically on the back of that play from the Obersoldat, and that means that the Soviet player can't hold on to this location nearly as hard as it might have been able to if the KV-2 was repairing. So yeah, you really have to be careful now. So that's actually really nice. And it's going to be an SU-85. Mm, I am feeling this composition from Hans Chicken. Yeah. All right. This is what we like. This is such a balanced con composition. It's so bad. Look at this. He's got great core infantry. He's got some good specialized infantry. I'm going to say the AT gun's a bit weak for what's going on. I would love to see him back tech into support armor core uh, Campania. Uh, support armor? Um, sorry, support weapon Campania. 
um, because I think access to Maxim guns is huge, and I think that having Zis guns now is just... I think it's okay to just lose these AT guns, trade them out for any value you can, and just replace them with Zis guns as the game goes on. Like, look to be doing that anyway. Um, although, having said that, with the SU-85, maybe you don't need the Zis guns. Maybe it's okay just to have the two light AT guns supporting the SU-85, and that's fine. What do they get at max veterancy? Improves accuracy and penetration. So one of these guns does have the enhanced penetration. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And we've got the high explosive canister rounds, effective against infantry. When did the M42 get these bad boys? I did not know that that was a button that they had. Hmm. Okay, well that's exciting. Okay, Panther here, taking a bit of a dive, comes forward. Gonna cop a shell off the KV-2 as my mouse has another malfunction. Taking substantial damage, so clearly once these AT guns get to 3 star veterancy, they are a threat for the Panther. And now we've got a Jagdpanzer, and I feel like we often get it on this map where ooh, the health on this uh, Schwer Panzer HQ is low but I feel like we often get it on this map where the players it does come down to a tank hunter face off and SU-85 versus Yagdi is my kind of game I am liking what I'm seeing from these players here two stars of veterancy now on the KV-2 that is giving it improving targeting and range on that main cannon so that's some scary stuff he wants to threaten the uh wants to threaten the uh schwer pans hq that is a bit of a waste of ammo right now because we know a lot of angry axis armor is about to roll into the crosshair of these units so the su-85 kites back watch for it to just get ridiculous penetrating hits on anything it wants to hit but the jagdpanzer coming in using its range to stalk the su-85 that's the most important thing and he gets it with the jagdpanzer wow i think to a certain extent hands chicken just getting a bit unlucky he picks off the panzer four so that's nice whoa you need to pull back the kv2 man this jagdpanzer is still here oh god he's gonna lose the kv2 how does that round bounce? He gets so lucky, but this is still a dead KV-2. This is way too much AT resources. And uh, with the Stuka Strike coming in, these exchanges heavily favoring the Axis player now. You'll trade a Panzer IV for an SU-85 for KV-2 any day. And now Axis Infantry breaking through. Obersoldaten, Storm Pioneers, Jaeger Lights plying their deadly trade. The M42 AT guns getting picked down. And Penal Battalion are not enough to stem the tide here. Now, where's the Katusha? It's in a relatively safe position for now. So, okay, no danger to the Katusha for now. But Hans Chicken suddenly in a really bad way. Now, I didn't see exactly how, but the Yagdi gets put down to a pixel, more or less. And the Panther is also in a bad way, engine stricken and trying desperately to get out of there. Um, but I feel like... Okay, so another KV-2... Oh, of course, the 180-second cooldown only begins once the KV-2 dies, because, of course, that's how... Heavy tank call-ins work in this game now. Cool. All right. Nice. So Hans Chicken has some fuel and will have some manpower if he's able to save up to spend that fuel. The question is, are we going for another SU-85 straight away or are we going to try and hold out for the uh, KV-2 in 115 seconds? Now, uh, I feel like you need the SU-85 to not die at this point. Um, one M42 AT gun. He did lose the veteran one. So this one, really not much of a threat to a Panther. Um... So I feel like he needs the SU-85 to not die. I think that's got to be the, the line here. But, I mean, clearly Hans Chicken getting the worst end of that last engagement in a really big way. He also has lost some of his core infantry, losing one of the penal battalion. That's pretty scary. Flat half track comes through from ill-advised dive here. Not sure about this. Going to have to pop smoke and, and, and head, head away. Uh, might have just been a lure to get the case. Okay, so, yeah, getting the Jagdpanzer set up to cover against the T-70 here is nice. The T-70, hang on, look how good the Jagdpanzers are. They're ridiculous. They're so good. Why don't players build these more? Oh, he gets lucky there. Wow, the Katusha coming forward. Risk! Are we really doing this? Wow, that Katusha taking some risks from Mother Russia there. And all the Axis armor survives. And, uh... I mean, is this game-ending damage? 93 tickets only. Oh, sorry, that's for the Axis player. Oh, wow. So Hans Chicken actually has quite a lot of... Fine, it's because, as always in this game, <laughs> we've got the Axis HUD on the left side, despite the fact that they are, you know, the East spawning player, and we've got the, the, the uh, Soviet HUD on the on the right side despite the fact that they're the west spawning player like this this happens often so okay sorry so we're actually at a point now where the okw player is has to, yeah okay so this game's not over because hans chicken just has enough time to rebuild their army you know we're talking like five minutes at least of grace that hans chicken has just based on how far ahead they have been on the score line this game so yeah this ain't over 
But this is going to be difficult, man. Panther Yagdi is an intimidating anti-armor roster. But, I mean, Hans Chicken has to rebuild so much. Um, has, to, has to get something to deal with these armored units. Probably an SU-85 is, like, the most sort of encapsulated... Pardon me, encapsulating solution for that. And now, uh, wow, shock troops actually get up on top of these Axis infantry and are going to defend a VP. That's material. That's nice. Um, but yeah, so you need something to answer the Axis armor. And you need to bolster this infantry roster because this will not be enough to make a meaningful play for the for the victory points. Um, especially if Kanji is super smart and buys a second MG34 as this game goes on, hopefully soon. Um, or if... Does he have mechanized... He does have mechanized regiment HQ going down. Oh, he lost the Schwer Panzer HQ. Okay, but this is cool because a Panzerwerfer is the other acceptable add-on to this army that makes it very difficult for the Soviet player to challenge for VP control, which clearly is what this game's going to be about. For, for a Soviet win from here, basically has to be VP related. I don't think you're going to win by crushing the army. So, still has the Katusha. Oh, he gets the Storm Pioneers. Oh. oh, just when Kanji felt like things were kind of all going their way. Lucky Katusha spread there. The first four rockets, I think it was, just give the Storm Pioneers. And, like, you, you have to rebuy those because now you cannot repay your tanks. So that kind of sucks. You have to rebuy those. Uh, Panther gets uh, falls foul of some mines right in front of a uh, AT gun here. And, uh, okay, the flak half-track moves in to support. You have to focus the flak half-track. Oh, no, he wastes the shot. I guess he couldn't see the flak half-track in Fog of War. Um, yeah, you really need to go for the flak half-track. The reload speed on these AT guns is pretty quick, so this flak half-track cannot stay and fight. How many munitions? Okay, so Hans Chicken is floating enough munitions now that I think it is the right choice, definitely now in the game, to be going for the PTRS upgrades on your uh, penal battalion. Because... You know, PTRSs in that fight would probably have killed this. And PTRSs will just con continuously dink the uh, the other armor in the game. And that is value right now. You need value against these armored units. And I think it's probably time to, like... Have we got the support weapon, Kamana? Hmm. I feel like Maxims... I feel like two Maxims and buying PTRSs makes this infantry roster acceptable again. Like... With those tools, you can realistically play for VP, VP control. But speaking of tools, it's going to be a KV-2 once again. But this KV-2 coming onto a much more sort of tough battlefield than its predecessor. Because we're coming in now to a one-star Yagdi and a two-star Panther. And that's tough. That is really tough. KV-2s are reasonable, but they are slow. And they don't really, they don't really perform spectacularly against... Um, uh, vehicles like they are okay they can contribute to vehicles but they're not like they ain't they ain't vehicle slayers really okay actually there's a wounded Jagdpanzer up here is he gonna go for that if he gets behind it with the kv with the mt70 wow he really wants this Jagdpanzer. if he can pick this up this is so risky but he's going for it if he can just get the k the t70 around behind it it's dead I don't, why is he not diving with the KZ-70? Wow, he gets the Yagdi. This game just keeps swinging. He gets a bit lucky there. I feel like that's just a bit lucky picking up that Yagdi. I didn't see how the Yagdi got its engine broken. I have to assume it was mines. And now Soviet forces are going to re-establish the cap. Or re-establish the bleed. And 55 is not a large number of tickets before victory is established. So this game actually swinging right back. With the demise of the Jagdpanzer, that means the KV-2 can just like dictate control over the midline of the map. And that means that the victory point victory scenario is totally achievable again for Hans Chicken. Okay, so the Panther finally finds the KV-2. If he can kill this, okay, here comes the Stuka. He basically has to kill this now. That's a Soviet Kettenwerfer. Oh no, yeah, he's gonna get it. Man, Hans Chicken has just been consi consistently like out there with the micro on these KV-2s. Like, sometimes been great, sometimes just been way too ambitious. That's a demo charge. <gasps> okay, five-star oversold art and squad as well, by the way. That's scary. They're just they're just ripping 
ripping out, ripping these infantry apart. Oh god, is that even going to be a fullback? Okay, yeah, he gets out of there. Five star oversold art and about as nasty as it gets. Uh, this game just keeps on swinging. Is the is the Katusha ready? It is ready. I reckon we t we definitely take the shot. It's too late now. He's already captured it. I feel like that was a shot to have taken just to deny the cap on that point. Just eke out. Like, that would have been four or five more victory points, maybe more. And a chance at wiping the Oversold Arten. I think we take that every day. Oversold Arten laying a booby trap. Getting a little bit sneaky out here. I like it. I like it. All right, the booby trap is established. That is a wounded ass T70 to be t t a wounded ass T70 to be leading the charge here. Of course, he does have the uh, veterancy and the observer mode is on, so that is providing gratuitous amounts of light of sight, line of sight there for Hans Chicken. Katusha comes forward, takes a barrage into a very exposed MG34. The fallback is a bit late, allowing additional barrages to start hitting, and it would be unlikely at this range that they'll survive. Yeah, so nicely coming forward there to get the accurate barrage. Gonna nuke one of your opponent's most valuable squads for controlling your access onto those VPs. So that is a super relevant squad to have, uh, you know, destroyed with the Kato, with the uh, Katusha. So that's, that's nice. These two players just dealing blows. And you know what? We're kind of actually at, like, okay manpower income. These armies are, like, not huge again at 42 minutes nearly in this game. T70 feels plucky. Wants a piece of the five-star flak half-track. That was a big boom. Oh, was that the... Uh, I think that was the booby trap going off. Dude, Hans Chicken is stacking 600 manpower. It's okay to start using booby traps, man. I think when you have this much... It's like, you know, start putting down some demo charges, lay more mines, throw down some uh, booby traps. Think about getting PTRSs. He's just not going to back tech. I don't know. I feel like that's a mistake. I feel like Maxim Guns would be really good. Because Maxim Guns, like, beat all of your opponent's infantry. And if you beat all of your opponent's infantry, then they they cannot contest the victory points. And that is what this game is about. It's about contesting the victory points. For even just a small window, then you win. So I feel like Maxim Guns would be really useful. Doing a really good job of policing territory at the moment is uh, Kanji. This flak half track has killed a lot of Soviets. How, so what do we get on this? We get cheap smoke. We get uh, better aiming. We get better maneuverability. We get better accuracy and rate of fire. Yikes. And we get better penetration and range. Jesus. So that half track is now quite the intimidating. That's a KT. Yep. Cool. So, I mean, yeah, he did throw down the mechanized reg that we all saw. Uh, we're building T-34s into KTs and Panthers. What is this tank doing here? Why? When, when was this ever going to be a good choice? Oh no, I, I don't like this. This is never going to be able to do anything. Oh man, I feel like you had to save that fuel and try and... Or save that manpower and put it into an SU-85. Because at least that can deal with this stuff. Whereas a T-34 is like... It's just never going to do it. Never going to do it. And I don't feel like you're really struggling to deal with the Axis infantry here. The problem is the armor. And an SU-85... You have the time for an SU-85 to scale and deal with the KT. You're not going to do it in one fight, but once it gets to two stars of veterancy and then three, which it will do quite quickly against the KT and the Panther, um, then the SU-85, you know... Then the KT is not just, it's just not very good once there's like a three star SU 85 on the field, as long as you don't fall asleep on the micro. And now we've lost a lot of our core infantry, we've got T 34, T 70, Katusha, mmm, mmm, against, you know, Panther KT, mmm. And our cushion of VPs is rapidly diminishing as the Soviet player, so I don't know. This is going to be a tough one. Is he going for another KV-2? No, it's an SU-85. Okay, this is the right choice for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An SU-85 gives you a hope of victory in this game. I feel like any other choice is not going to do it. Because you don't even have to beat or destroy the Panther and the, and the KV uh, and the KT. It'll be nice, but you don't have to do that. You just have to force them away for a, quite a short amount of time so that you can just 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 take the VPs and just beat your opponent. 
Oh my god, this black half track just surviving again. And now the Panther comes in for the T bone. Nearly gets it. T70 is like, I'll take some of that rear armor. Yo, look at me. I'm still in recon mode. Look at me. Okay, he remembers to turn on the gun. Now he's getting some rear armor hits. The uh, T70 attempts for the ram. Gets the ram. The T70, come on, bro. We've got to get the rear armor. Or else, what are we doing? Okay, even the rear armor. A bit much. And now the SU-85 actually comes out at the perfect time to pick down a super stricken unit. Arr, this is the best start in life for an SU-85. He's going to get a star of veterancy on the next penetrating hit. Nice. This is how we do. That is the impact of an SU-85. This is how games feel. Feel the difference in texture between having this unit alive as a possibility in the Axis player's mind and just the Axis player knowing that there is no SU-85. Like, it forces them to play completely differently. It's just such a powerful unit. Oh my god, he's being so risky with it though. He's just driving it out. You don't have to beat the KT right now, bro. Oh, but he wants to. He's just going to stalk it down. This is, oh man, this is classic SU-85-ing. It's risky that he's coming out this far with it, but he's taking some shots. Okay, you should fall back now. You should fall back now. I suppose... Alright, yeah, sorry. I forgot he saw that and he knows he can just take that, but now you need to get out. This SU-85 is your last and best final hope in this game. Cannot, cannot lose this unit, please. Nice. It's okay, as long as there is something in front of and around the SU-85, just so that Axis armor and Axis units cannot sneak into his flanks. Although, actually, now I think about it, the, the only unit that can kill the SU-85 is the King Tiger. It Like, nothing else can actually meaningfully touch this unit. And he's almost got two stars of veterancy, man. This is what I mean. When you have a target-rich environment for an SU-85, it will vet up very rapidly. It, we're talking like six penetrating hits, maybe seven to get it to VET 2. And that's material, because VET 2 is when it gets the rate of fire. Sorry, I take it back. VET 2 is when it gets the penetration and accuracy. Then VET 3 is the rate of fire. But I mean, VET 2 and 3, they are both massive damage multipliers for that unit. And it is relatively, you know, we've just seen, it gets there quick. If you are taking the right shots into the right units, it does not take very long for the SU-85 to achieve the... Look, it's already two-star. Now these hits are real stingers. Even the frontal armor on the KT, not really going to be bouncing many shots from this SU-85, even at decent range. And that's that's how it feels when the SU-85 is out. So what are we doing here? We're moving it into south, where it has no support and is just driving into fog of war. And we're not using recon mode, so this is risky. I mean, there just could be mines out here or anything, bro. This is your only thing that you've got going on. Now he turns it around. What are we doing? This is not how you micro an SU-85. It's imagine a line that's the best way of using tank destroyers and vehicles that don't have a turret you have to just move them forwards and backwards along a certain line you don't want to be turning them to move the direction they want to go they just want to come in then push out and then come in and then push out you know it's okay to change which line they're moving on but just keep them oriented correctly i don't know it's easy for me to criticize i'm just up here being my observer seeing all the stuff saying why aren't these players doing the right things it's like well because they're doing like 50 other things at once <laughs> not to mention that they've got like 48 minutes at least 48 minutes of fatigue because you know concentrating this hard for 48 minutes is difficult mistakes start creeping in no one's perfect we're all humans <clears throat> okay i actually really like this t-34 now that it has an su-85 to support this t-34 looks really smart and now, you know, we've got the triple cap established. Axis forces managed to get onto north, but I mean, they got to do something about mid or south as well, or this game's going to end real quick. Oh, yikes. T-70 coming in here. Going to feed itself into this Rakettenwerfer. Gets around the arc. Going to eat the arc of something else, though. But, I mean, three tickets remain. That ain't enough. And a fantastic win from Hans Chicken here. Not a perfect win. Mistakes were made. But this is RTS and we are humans. And within the context of those constraints, this is definitely just like one of the better games that we could have hoped to have caught. Um, explosive compositions, dynamic action-packed strategies and moments coming out in this game. Um, Nexus once again proving itself to be a map that perhaps may not be the most popular with some players, but will always be popular with me. I like maps that are just a just have a little bit more going on than just you and your opponent kind of real close to each other with all your units always fighting. Like 
just a little just give us a little bit more room to flank give us a little bit more difference and terrain across the map like have some areas that are built up and have line of sight blockers and then have some areas that are open so that units that flourish in both of those different environments have a place in the game on this map um and you know the kt like didn't feel omnipresent on this map in the way that it feels on langerskyr and crossroads because it wasn't, you know? It can only be in one place at one time on a map like this. Same for the KV2. Players are having to make meaningful choices about where they task their units and how they commit them. And uh, I, I, I was entertained. I was entertained. Um, a lot happened in that game, and I don't think I can really meaningfully go back and deconstruct a lot. Um... I'm unconvinced about the Overwatch Doctrine pick on this map. I didn't see anything where I was just like, that commander changed the game, you know, in any particular moment. Like, the Jaeger Lights survived the whole game. 24 kills, 5 stars of veterancy. That all looks very impressive, and they were undoubtedly useful. Does that justify an entire commander pick? Could you have found greater value from choosing another commander? I mean, that question is definitely viable. Um, from Hans Chicken yeah safe to say we saw more value out of this commander the m42 at guns undoubtedly providing a good measure of insurance against axis vehicular stuff for the first 20 minutes of the game and then even after that going on to provide some utility um largely thanks to one of them being three star um and the shock troops seemed okay through various phases of that game would love to have seen booby trap used a bit more we ended the game on 654 munitions stacked so probably we could have seen more mines more upgrades more stuff like that but i am nitpicking more booby traps um the kv2 was um was a real unit in that game definitely um we saw two of them and yes they were both destroyed but they did change the game meaningfully those kv2s destroyed units dictated play locked down areas of map forced the axis player to respect them and reduce the amounts of profitable lines of play that were open to kanji in that game so you cannot really say that those kv2s did not provide value did they provide enough value in conjunction with the M42 and the other little bits of value from the shock troop to justify this commander? Yeah, probably. Um, would another commander have suited better on this map and, and given the way this game went? Yeah, probably. Um, but still cool to see this commander, still cool to see the KV-2. Uh, should hands have back teched into a support armor campanoia at some point in this game to have access to maxims and to to a lesser sort of degree of urgency zis guns i don't know it's difficult to say to be honest because although maxims would undoubtedly have been useful i don't really feel like from the time i suggested back teching that he ever really had the manpower to to easily go and get them so i don't know without watching this game again i feel like it's difficult to assess but I do feel like, on a general note, I, I think players often go for various ways of circumventing or doing funky, cool tacking styles. And that looks great, and it can provide a lot of utility and value in the first 30, 35 minutes of the game. But after that, the cost of teching and completing your tech tree and having access to those units that you cleverly managed to survive without, the cost of reaccessing those is actually quite small relative to the amount of stuff that you've been spending up to that point in the game. And... I think players should remember to back tech more often because you, sometimes you're just like yeah I've been playing the sick style and I didn't have to build x or y or research z and that's sick value and then like you're like yeah I've done that I've like cemented that value and then in the late game when you're really struggling it 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 doesn't feel intuitive and it can feel bad even to like back tech and go and get those things but from the top tier players that is what i see more consistently is they are like you know what this game's gone on for like 38 minutes it's probably going to go on for another 10 or 20 this is a game that's going to be easier for me to win if i just go and build the pretty inexpensive tech building in my base and just get out a x or y unit that i need to do the thing that's helping on the map in this case it would have been maxims controlling ground um so like i say in in the context of this sample of one game i'm not sure if that's an applicable criticism to be honest but generally i would say players out there 
do remember to back tech oftentimes i think people just get set in the mindset that they've teched a certain way and that's that done and then the teching phase of the game is open and they're just playing with the bits that they have access to but it's like no you can go and back tech and i think it, there is value left unmined by players who are not doing it as often as they should just a general observation um all right cool right well two two really entertaining games cast there what a pleasure to cast thank you very much for spending your time with the magpie today and uh yeah this for now magpie 842 signing out <laughs>